Multidisciplinary research becomes more and more important. At the same time, bringing scientists from different disciplines together can be challenging. We follow the research process over the course of eight months to discover that multidisciplinary research isn't always that easy. But how complicated is it really? Could you explain a project in five sentences? I would say the project is about interdisciplinary research, bringing researchers together, uh, analyzing movement of individuals that can inform our movement model, uh, pedestrian model, and also on top of that a research on how a message type or a whether message type affects the sustainable choices that children may make. The project from my point of view is mostly about uh, the movement and the measurement of uh, people moving around in space. So uh, we are interested to see if giving children messages about the plastic problem and maybe what they can do about it, whether this changed their, their behaviour for the better. We are mainly involved in this project because we uh, aim to model and simulate processes that are difficult to do in real life. So for us it was important to create an environment that would support this experiment, to be able to um, control the experiment and also to acquire the data that comes out of it and to visualize the outcomes of that, to monitor it. This project is an attempt to set up multidisciplinary uh, research uh, endeavors where researchers from different backgrounds and different disciplines work together to answer a question of broader societal significance. In this case, uh, how do we measure and model uh, and think about how people move through space, which is a question that arises in many uh, substantive contexts. Uh, for instance, uh, in the COVID crisis, it was very important to have an idea of how people move through spaces, and that's also one of the backgrounds of this project. In this project we work together with scientists from uh, various disciplines, uh, psychology, mathematical psychology, communication science, computational science. How did the experiment get started? The roots of this experiment started a long time ago when we were measuring uh, how people move around in spaces to uh, uh, optimize physical design of spaces in the COVID time. So we wanted to understand how people move, move through space and how we can arrange the space to maximize uh, distance. And when we were doing that, we found out that there were no good models to describe and analyze and simulate human behavior in this context. So we started out to uh, develop these kinds of models ourselves, and we now have them, uh, but uh, we still need data to inform the parameters of these models. So basically to calibrate the the movements that uh, happen in our simulations to actual real life. There was a long uh, road uh, before uh, w uh, working towards the uh, NEMO uh, Museum uh, experiment where we tested the system first in a very small room uh, at uh, the campus where we uh, learned how to set up the anchors and uh, calibrate the system but we could hardly move around it was very small and then we uh, gradually moved to bigger rooms uh, we started uh, renting out the um, uh, a sports hall uh, of the uh, Amstel campus, so the university gym, and there we were really able to test out the system in a in a very large space uh, to really move around, see uh, what how the system functions, for example, at the perimeter of the the area. May have been unstructured, but that was also because we didn't know exactly what to expect. We needed to have some experience with this tracking system, so we did not know anything about. Uh, how it, it would perform and how well it would perform in different situations. So the experiments that we did in this uh, uh, training center um, were very important to be able to get a feeling on how that system would perform and how uh, it would handle different situations. So it was good that we did this because we encountered situations where there were a lot of reflections that had a consequence on, on the structure of the data and the, um, the noise on the data. Uh, so now uh, that we did this, we also realized that we should take precautions if we 
uh, installed that system in different situations. And in particular, uh, ferromagnetic material uh, happened to be of influence on the quality of the tracking data that came out of that. So it was good that we did this. So the movement data that we'll collect will be used for the movement model. So it's a pedestrian model that researchers from the psychological methods department are creating. And the model will use the XY coordinates that come out of the system. And there were some requirements on the data uh, that, that the data needed to have in order for it to fit the model. And one of them was that uh, we should know as researchers what the goal of participants was. I had some role in the design of the task that the kids will do because um, the model needs to know the goals of the people moving around and so we set up an experiment in which we gave the children um, spatially defined goals uh, so to, to go to a, one tablet and do something and then move to another one so that we knew the movement course they were supposed to take and then we could measure the way they actually did that movement. So this also formed sort of a template on which we could run an additional experiment. So we did a lot of work on calculating uh, energy consumption of the participants of the experiments and also feedback on how well they did. Unfortunately, we had to take that out uh, because, uh, well, we, we were a little bit too late with adding those, those changes. So that was a bit frustrating, but nevertheless, um, the data that came out of the whole experiment still allows Andrew to use that data um, and, and to um, at least work on his pedestrian model. And then in parallel, while testing this movement part and the technical aspects thereof, we also started collaborating with uh, researchers from the Communicational Science Department in actually designing an experiment that the children or, or, or participants at NEMO would take place in. And this has a different focus. It's, it's more on sustainability. So it's not, it's not in, inherently, it's not linked to the movement uh, experiment. I think this was for me the first time that I joined so late. On one hand, it's weird to join a little bit later because you don't know the people yet. On the other hand, uh, because it was still very early for our experiment, we could just design everything ourselves. Plastic consumption is a, is a big problem and most children are also aware of this. Um, but we are interested in to see if you would just ask them questions about their awareness and whether they feel they can make a difference and about their attitudes, whether this is already high or whether this is somewhat low and if giving them a message about how important the problem is might make them even more aware or might uh, that they maybe change even their behavior. I constantly had the feeling that we did not really have a storyline behind the experiment. So we wanted ch children to participate in the experiment, but there was not really an incentive for the children to take part in it. So I think that the, the great contribution that Marijn did was to uh, give the whole experiment a context in environmental science so that children were being told about the consequences of their choices um, onto the environment and also maybe influence their decision making in the process. But then of course we also wanted to do a real test uh, also with the system that was developed so the, by the visualization lab, so the whole, the whole interface that we were using on the tablets to let the children walk around or participants walk around and uh, the real test for that was during uh, the opening of the lab 42. The, the tablets up and uh, yeah, visitors to the opening, they could uh, get uh, register themselves, get a tag, walk uh, up to one of the tags and uh, tablets. And then we were also testing out the whole system of giving them assignments to walk to a next tablet through a middle point and to see how that all worked. In our original plan, we wanted to give the children uh, feedback. But the measurement error that's in the system causes this error and thereby uh, can, it, it can result in incorrect feedback. Having the different discipline that, that, that Andrew and I come from, we notice this is, this is very bad. If we give wrong feedback, clearly children will do something with this feedback and they will start moving in different ways. So now we actually decided having no feedback is better than having wrong feedback. Well, in hindsight, we should have done more and also lengthier experiments. And probably what we also shouldn't have done was combine it with the opening of Lab 42. So this also very clearly shows that 
things that I did not think would be very uh, difficult for them to implement all of a sudden is a problem. And I did not even, I wasn't even aware that I should highlight this as a problem. So the, 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 the run through through Lab 42 was sort of very exciting and seeing what everything is possible and, 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 and very great, everything that has been achieved. And at the same time, we encountered problems that I wasn't even aware of that, that were there. So it shows how crucial it is to have such run-throughs, I would say. And we should have allocated more time to do specific experiments and try out the system and stress test it. Um, because at the opening, there was just too little time or circumstances to make it um, a, well, a, a really good test. And so in hindsight, we, should, we could have avoided a lot of the problems that we encountered in Nemo by taking a little bit more time and also start earlier. project has been sort of extending and, and becoming bigger and bigger and that maybe it's good to do a brief round so that everyone knows who is who and what everyone is uh, working on. Oh, it's interesting to see um, how people are coming from different backgrounds, but because um, on the one hand we're all working together, but on the other hand everybody has their own um, um, responsibilities. So it's good to see that everybody's taking their responsibilities and it's interesting to learn from them. Um, but it's really also kind of coexisting along each other. After all these months of, of working together and then, and then talking uh, to some people that, that some things were not clear for them, well, whereas they, they were clear for me from the start. And I, I honestly think that it has taken us eight months to communicate that it wasn't clear. The communication between different types of scientists is not always unproblematic. So if you have uh, um, uh, informatics people talking to psychologists, talking to communication uh, people, you, you notice that there are many differences in how people are in the culture basically. And people come from different backgrounds, ask different kinds of questions and have to sort of take the perspective of the other person. So I'm used to that um, interface between the more social and behavioral sciences and the more quantitative, um, hard sciences. Um, so that um, I think involves navigating somewhat different languages sometimes, somewhat different expectations um, and uh, it's something that I found I don't find too difficult to do because I sort of understand both worlds to some degree. Yeah, so it's definitely true that the, the, you see the differences between the, the beta discipline and the alpha discipline. Uh, but yeah, in some cases there is a bit of frustration. So I think the fact that we were working together for a longer time helped the communication, but the fact that the project became bigger and the questions became yeah, uh, com more complex also uh, had an effect on the communication and, and the dynamics. Yeah, so in Nemo we had a room uh, that was specially allocated for this experiment. Uh, so this was quite a big room where we had uh, uh, nine tablets or eight tablets uh, that we were uh, able to spread around in the room in a, in a square area. Um, and there was also a sufficient area to hang up this connection system to scan the whole area. Um, and it also had the facilities like networking facilities to be able to set up the experiment and connect it to our back-end infrastructure so that everything would be made to work. The children who would participate, they were invited to uh, wear a vest and uh, which we, uh, in, in the back of the vest, we uh, put a sensor and the sensor uh, uh, was then tracking their location um, uh, throughout the experiment. Then we asked them to watch a video and then after seeing the video, they would start uh, walking around for 10 minutes. And during those 10 minutes, we actually did two things simultaneously. So on the one hand, we were collecting movement data, so XY co coordinates continuously. And at the same time, whenever uh, they came to a tablet, at some points they were asked to fill out some questionnaires. So uh, these questionnaires spent uh, various things, so their knowledge about the plastic problem, their attitude towards the plastic problem. And then completely at the end, uh, children were asked that, um, that they could uh, choose a present for their uh, participation in the experiment. And it was either a donation of 25 cents uh, to the Plastic Soup Foundation, so to clean up plastics from the ocean, or they could uh, 
opt for a plastic present, either a pen, um, a, uh, uh, a, a bracelet of plastic. So there were four presents and each time they could choose, I'd go for the present or I donate the money. So then we actually have an actual behavioral outcome measure as well. So in this all lasted 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, so we were doing two things every the whole time, the movement part and the sustainability experiment. Well, I, I never expected that something goes wrong, but I'm always worried that something goes wrong. And so, well, it did in this case as well. And it always happens. So anytime when you run an experiment like this, there are always things that go wrong. And especially at the worst moment in time, we had a lot of problems that we couldn't figure out at that moment in time. So we had to stop the experiment for a, a good part of the day and figure out what the reason for that is. At one point in time, it was really, uh, well, almost disastrous. Yeah, so I remember um, uh, I remember that day that I wasn't there at uh, Nemo, but I remember get, getting all these calls and it wasn't working and we're getting these error messages that we did not expect or that we also do, did not understand. And to be honest, I was a little bit surprised about how relaxed I was because I honestly thought this is it, we need to solve it, we need to tackle the problem step by step and there's nothing we can, like like stressing too much over it is not gonna help us now. And and I honestly do also think that, you know, we, we had quite a big team. Uh, so I was also quite confident that, that we would solve it together, yeah. You know, in preparing for an experiment, you always try to think of everything that can go wrong and provide potential solutions for that. So it's also a little bit of a challenge to just go ahead with it, encounter the problems and then find a solution as we go. So, yeah. And during the end of the experiment, everything went rather smooth. Now looking back at it and having had 570 children participate in a two-week period, I think, yeah, it's really, I'm, I'm really happy and uh, positively surprised about those results. So I think the best results come when you do merge disciplines, and I've done a lot of interdisciplinary things. So I think that's where the most creativity is, but creativity is um, often painful and difficult. And, uh, you know, so, so, yeah, there are some certainly some, some things to navigate there, but I do think it's a really worthwhile, um, that's how you get worthwhile outcomes, is, is working through those difficulties. So in any multidisciplinary project, um, it takes time to understand each other. It takes time to get on the, uh, the same level. Uh, it takes a lot of time to be able to understand other people, but it also takes time for the other people to understand what we are doing and what, what our worries are and our problems are. Um, so, you know, in any type of multidisciplinary project, you need to take that time and you need to be able to uh, start early uh, do a lot of communication with each other and um, and and try uh, try very hard to understand what each other's problems are and and find the common ground. So one of the things I learned is that our university does not have a very clear operational procedure to make this kind of thing work. I think it makes the lines shorter between people and the UVA because while well, we are here at Hotels Island. Uh, others are at Science Park, or even just the psychologists who are across the water, we don't speak each other, uh, we don't speak to each other that often. So I think what is really nice is that you also get to know each other easily, uh, so you can ask others for another project in the future. So we've had to develop many, many things from scratch, much more than I actually anticipated. And that's maybe also something that you typically get when you get these multidisciplinary questions because you are asking questions that have not been asked before in this kind of context. So you have to adapt uh, whatever exists to, to accommodate that. And that's not at all trivial. Multidisciplinary research is important because the problems we are studying are so complex that we can only solve them with a multidisciplinary approach. Thank you.